Hi, my name is Christine Robbins and I'm Associate Professor of Kurdish Studies in the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies uh, at the University of Exeter. And I'm going to share with you today um, a direction that my research has taken in recent years, sadly determined by world events, um, which uh, is about the theme of cultural loss and cultural preservation. So I'm going to play you a video which is from um, an online archive we set up as part of a project uh, that I worked on with the University of Leiden. And I'm going to introduce you to some people you may not have met before. Um, this elderly gentleman here um, is called Farhan. And here he is. He's coming down to the river. Now Farhan lives in Canada, but he's come to this river which is in Australia, it's not far from Sydney in New South Wales. And um, he's, the other gentleman in the water with him is a priest who's called Tami de Payam, and he's much younger than Farhan. Now you can see Farhan is, is dipping his head three times in the water. Um, and that he's all dressed in white clothes, uh, which is uh, symbolic of a robe of light, which the soul wears. So. Farhan has come all the way to do this four times in one day. And uh, so what he's going to do is this, this ritual will finish and then he'll get out of the water again and then he'll start again. And the ritual is more complicated than what you see in the video. There are things that happen before and afterwards. Now Payam is, uh, Tarmida Payam must hold his staff under his left arm and uh, with um, and then he adjusts Farhan's um, turban. Can you see how Farhan's shivering? He must be absolutely icy cold. Um, and Payam will then uh, anoint him with the living water of the river. And then he will uh, take that piece of myrtle that uh, Farhan has got wrapped around his finger. Um, and he will put that under the, um, uh, under the turban. And then he will put his hand on Farhan's head and um, he will baptize him um, which means uh, in the name of life, in the name of the knowledge of life. And those words, like everything that those two men are saying to each other, are in, Acham are in Aramaic, which is the language of Jesus Christ. And also more to the point, the language of John the Baptist, um, who is um, the early leader that's the Mandaeans revere, because these people are called Mandaeans or Sabians, Sabians, and it means that they're baptizers, um, and they practice baptism uh, a lot. There, he's finished, he's got out the water now. They, you can practice baptism every week if you like, um, but they certainly practice it also at um, important points in life, like uh, marriage and um, on the uh, religious festivals. So, uh, and the death rituals are also very important. Now the priests perform all these rituals for the Mandeans, and this is actually why Farhan came all the way, because Farhan lives in Canada where there are no priests, so he can't have a ritual life there, so he has to come to where the priests are. Now, the reason that they have the baptisms is that they believe that uh, baptism in the living water gives them a connection with the light world and the beings of light that serve the great life, um, because that's how they refer to God. Um, now, you can't convert to Mandeism. Uh, you have to be born one. So there's no missionary activity or proselytism. And for about 2,000 years, the ancestors of uh, Farhan and of Tarmi de Payam and of Khaldun and of all these people lived by the great rivers of uh, southern Iraq and southern Iran. So the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Karun, those rivers. And they were very quiet. They just pop up on the historical record now and again because they kept themselves to themselves. They're very pacifist. They're still pacifists now. And um, in the 20th century, they, uh, a, lot, a whole generation of them became very educated uh, and um, became uh, doctors, dentists, engineers, and other ones uh, became uh, very noted craftsmen in silver and gold. They're very famous for that in the area. 
Unfortunately, in recent years, with the escalation of violence uh, in Iraq in particular, but also um, in the whole, across the whole region affecting the Iranian community, um, many of them were driven from their homes. Some of them were attacked directly. Um, others just received threats. I know one family that left when they received a bullet in the post. Um, so they have had terrible experiences and crossed the world uh, and are now scattered everywhere. About 10,000 in Sweden, um, about 10,000 in Australia, and um, a community uh, in the Netherlands as well. Um, so I have these clogs here and I'm reliably informed that uh, because clogs are very useful, obviously, if you're going to stand in a river for a long time, I'm reliably informed that the only people in the Netherlands that still wear clogs are the Mandaeans. So we, we did a lot of interviews with older people, especially priests, and the older people are always very sad and very nostalgic for uh, the Iraq that used to be, the Iraq that where neighbours of different religions lived side by side and enjoyed each other's company. Uh, everyone knew each other, where the country was a leader in um, education and in um, healthcare as well. And sadly, that Iraq is, uh, well, Iraq is no longer like that, although so many youth are working to bring that back. Um, but the young Mandeans worldwide, they worry about identity. They don't tend to know much about their religion, especially if they don't have much contract, contact with priests. They don't know what their holy books say. They're educated alongside uh, Christians and Muslims who all know what their religion is supposed to be about. So that confuses them. And then there's the issue of marriage. If they're supposed to marry another Mandean and they're not allowed to marry out, um, and they meet someone and they fall in love, which happens a lot, will they be betraying their parents? And also, what about the memory of all those ancestors that have kept their faith going? Because once this community has gone, it's gone. So they worry a lot about marrying out as well. Now, sadly, the Mandaeans are not the only community facing, facing this kind of scenario. Um, I always imagine it being like a, a coral reef with lots of different species coexisting that suddenly gets bleached. And all that knowledge, if you think about it, even though a lot of this knowledge isn't written down, but all this knowledge, all this oral history, all these ways of living, um, wisdom about the world, uh, daily habits, practical knowledge, all those things that were adapted to the former place are just going to be lost. Um, I'll show you. This is a Himyana belt, which um, is worn for, you saw Farhan and Payam wearing them uh, before in the, in the baptism video. And um, who knows? Uh, only a handful of people know how to weave these. They have to be woven in a very special symbolic way because they're so holy. And yet there are very few people left who know how to, um, how to make them. So all this knowledge risks being lost. Now, of course, we shouldn't be too sentimental because religions always um, die eventually. Uh, all cult cultural institutions tend to die eventually. Um, but the problem here is that it's happened so violently that it's extremely hard for the community to manage. And this is where I see the role for um, outsiders such as myself. Um, it's not to preserve the things that we think are important because um, we should be guided in that by the community, but we can be allies in managing change. So I can see other peoples like the Mandeans um, who are perhaps not religiously like them, but face many of the same issues. So the Yezidis in northern Iraq are one group like that. Um, the Zoroastrians trod this, ro this road before and uh, became much smaller. They came from Iran and then India. So there are actually other groups facing these issues. And we can encourage uh, dialogue. We can enter into dialogue with various of these groups and um, collective dialogue with uh, various members of these groups interacting with each other on how to manage these issues. Um, cultural preservation is something that we can help with. I mean, we did work with, um, with a Mandian priest uh, to do our archive, but it's better um, 
I think I've moved on from that a bit now. And um, I'm now starting another project, which is an oral history project with Yezidis. And that is actually um, arising from a wish expressed by Yezidis um, to do a particular kind of work. And our role is to train them um, and to learn with them about how to do oral history in uh, crisis zones. So that is a, a, it's a very important aspect to be driven by their agendas in many ways. We can also advocate more for cultural support uh, from governments and NGOs and international organisations because I do find that whereas uh, many people are very used to thinking of humanitarian needs and humanitarian crises, they often don't have that perspective to look at um, a unique culture that risks being lost very quickly. Um, and so that is something that we can certainly contribute to that debate as well. So I've just taken you through a few of the reasons that I get up in the morning and the things that I think are really important in my research at the moment. And I'd like to thank you very much for listening.